Lord, I ask that if there's any in this room who are aware of a difficult decision that you are wanting them to make, that you would help them to realize that every difficult decision that we have to make for you is worth it. Thank you, Lord, for bringing my wife and I to this wonderful church. Lord, I ask for your presence here as, as I preach this word and that also that you'd give me a soft heart for these dear people in this room. I pray for the deacons for the upcoming year. I thank you so much for them. Lord, help them to realize that their labor for you is not in vain and that they are an important, vital aspect of our church. I ask that you'd bless them. I ask that you'd give them fullness of your spirit. I pray for those who have never served before, for Dave Kerner and Jerry Mills. I ask, Lord, that you would, if there's any nerves there, that you would calm their nerves and help them to realize that they are a valued part of our team and that you're going to use them. I pray for those who are returning, Norm and Justin and Alan and John and Don and Judson. I thank you for them. Lord, guard them from sin. Help them to see the cross when they do and walk in repentance and faith. Thank you for those who are returning, Neil and, or continuing, Neil and Ray and Roger and Tim. Thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness to you. And I ask, Lord, that you would unite us together as brothers in Christ, along with Pastor Adam and myself, as we seek to serve you and as we seek for your purposes for us in 2024. Now, Lord, you know that there are many people who are using their, ex their excellent musical abilities to prepare for the Christmas night of worship. Father, please meet with us in that night. Please bring our neighbors and guests who don't know you and that you would help them take a step closer to you. I pray, Lord, for those who are leading, that you would give them clarity and peace and help and love for those who are serving. And Lord, I thank you for the privilege of worshiping you on that night. I pray, Lord, for those who are considering membership here at the church for the 20 plus or so people that have gone through the new membership class, both the last one and this one. I pray, Lord, that you would help them, that you would guard them from the evil one, that you would help them to realize what uh, the importance of what they're doing, and Lord, that you would help them to realize that they need to increase their, their prayer and their dependence on you, and that we as a church need to pray for them regularly and faithfully. Lord, help them to hide their word, your word in their heart, that they might not sin against you, and that you would make it very clear to them if they're on the fence about joining or um, if they need your encouragement, that you would make it clear to them what your purposes are for them here at this church or if you would have them to be at a different church, Lord. Use us and help them to find their place in your kingdom. Thank you, God, for Pastor Steve DeWitt of the Bethel Church. I pray, Lord, that you would please empower him today as he preaches. Fill him with your spirit and give him great joy in the gospel and give them great fruit at that church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, a few years ago, my wife and I were into this show called Downton Abbey. Any Downton Abbey fans in the room? And some of you are like, yes, thank you. Yes, I am a huge fan, and I'm so glad you finally mentioned it. It's about the fancy Crawley family back in the early 1900s, and one of the guys dies, by the way, so spoiler alert. Anyway, um, the family had many servants. It's this really interesting kind of hierarchy of how things functioned back then, um, a super swanky picture there. The grandmother in the front is like the boss and hilarious. Anyway, so you've got these servants who work for the family, and they all live there at the Abbey, and there's this hierarchy of how these servants function and how they interact with one another. You've got the highest ones who are uh, uh, the butler and the housekeeper. They're at the head of the, the group in terms of dignity and authority and, and earnings. Then you've got the cook, you've got the valets, the ladies' maids, and the footmen, and then you've got the parlor maids, the laundry maids, the dishwashers, all the way down to the stable grooms. The stable grooms, they understood their role. So did the maids, so did the parlor maids, so did the butler and the cook. They all recognized that they were servants, that they were servants along together, but also that the Crawleys were in charge. Now a question for us. 
When it comes to how we inter interact together as a church family, or when it comes to how we interact together as Christians, what should our perspective be like toward one another? What's the hierarchy for how we should function as a church? Is the pastor the boss? Sounds good to me. Just kidding. That sounds scary. And then Pastor Adam, you're just kind of my hireling, bro. And then you've got, you're the muscle. Let's be real here, bro. And, and then you've got the deacons who kind of keep us in check as best as they can. And you got a problem, you go to the deacons. And then they kind of, you know, let us know what's up. And then you're all the minions, you know, of the church. Is that how it works here in this place? Today I'm preaching John 13, 1 through 17. And this series is focused on the topic of Jesus coming to earth to be a servant. Matthew 20 says that the Son of Man did not come to earth to be served, but to serve. And that's what we're focusing on in this series, that the reality that Jesus came to earth to be a servant. And what does that mean for us as Christians? What does that mean, the fact that he came to be a servant? What does that imply for us? How should we interact together? Today I have one point, one point for the same length of sermon, y'all, one point, and I'm going to explain it, and we're going to read the text as we go. Don't stand up. Somebody stood up at that moment, and it was a little awkward. So don't stand up. We're going to read the text as we go, and as I explain it, here's the main point. Since Jesus humbled himself to serve us, we should humble ourselves to serve one another. Since Jesus humbled himself to serve us, we should humble ourselves to serve one another. Let's look at God's word in John 13, starting in verse 1. I'll explain as we go. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The feast of a Passover was a Jewish celebration that commemorated the time when God's people were saved from the death angel at the last plague when God delivered Israel from the slavery to the Egyptians. You might remember that story when the death angel came, whoever put the blood of a lamb on the doorframe, the angel passed over that house and the person inside, the oldest firstborn male inside was saved from the death angel. And they were told to commemorate this by having a festival that they called Passover. Get it? Pass over the door. That's what they're commemorating here in John chapter 13. It's about that time to celebrate it, to remember what's happening. There's all kinds of significance in that that we won't get to today. But look at verse 1 again. It says, When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. That phrase, his hour had come, is referring to the time that he was going to die. His hour had come. He, he mentioned this back when he turned water to wine to his mother. He says, hey, mom, my hour is not yet here. Why are you trying to get me to do this? And then she's like, yeah, whatever. Um, do what he tells you. That's the way kind of moms kind of are sometimes. Anyway, other times he, he says, it says that he wasn't taken captive by the Jews because his hour had not yet come. It wasn't time for his death. Jesus' death was a sovereign moment that God had designed and set in motion from before time began. And he knew at this point in chapter 13 that his hour had finally come. He knew that he was about to die the very next day. It says that he was going to depart out of this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Of course, those that the, were given to him were the disciples that he's referring to here. He loved them to the very end. And what he's about to do in chapter 13 is a sign of his love. He's going to communicate his love for his disciples. Let's look now at verse 2. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Now they're eating supper there and they would eat at probably one large table. Here is a terrible joke. Are you ready? What did Jesus say at the Last Supper? Hey, everybody on this side of the table for a picture. 
Anyway, so that's what they're doing. They're eating supper there. You know, the painting, you know. They're eating supper there, and I said it was terrible. They're eating supper, and notice when it says in verse 2, now I'm getting serious again, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Judas was a betrayer from the beginning. He was greedy. He was following Jesus for years, but Jesus knew the whole time that he was going to betray him. The devil was involved in this. At this point, Judas had determined what he was going to do. The devil had said, had put it into his heart to betray Jesus. Jesus was aware of this, and it was set in motion, and it was soon to happen. But it also says in verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God. This is important as we consider what Jesus is about to do. Because when we talk about serving one another, you might think that, well, it's okay for me to serve people because I'm not that important, and I recognize that. But notice that Jesus realizes who he is. He knows that he is God's son. He knows that he's about to be exalted to the Father's right hand. And it's in that knowledge that he does what he's about to do. Let's keep going in verse 4. It says, He rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments. And taking a towel, he, he tied it around his waist. Can you imagine our King Jesus doing this? Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. John is slowing down what he's talking about. It's, it's kind of a literary technique. Notice how he mentions each thing one by one. He, he's, he's slowing down the narrative. He wants us to pay attention very carefully to what's happening here. It's like if you're watching a movie and then things suddenly move in slow motion, for an instance, as they want to magnify what's happening. He, he rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments. He's slowing it down. He wants us to pay attention to what's happening. His outer garments, you might say he's got a collared shirt on underneath his undershirt, and he's about to get dirty. And so he takes his outer garments off, and then he prepares to wash his disciples' feet. And he's doing it, and then he comes in verse 6. Look at what it says. It, he says, it came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Now, Simon Peter is a spokesperson for the disciples. He often says things that are quite silly, kind of comes out of his mouth, and he kind of tries to go like that to get him back in his mouth sometimes. That's who is speaking here. And we miss a little bit of something in the translation here because the emphasis in the original language is on the words you and my. It's like you would put it in italicized if it were in English. Lord, do you wash my feet? Simon recognizes who he is. He knows that Jesus is the king. He's been following him for years now. He's his master. He knows his, who he is. He says, do you wash my feet? Now, you're probably aware that those days were quite different than they are today. Their, their feet were different. They wore sandals, perhaps something similar to what looked like right here. And, of course, their roads weren't paved, and they didn't drive in cars. So they're walking by foot everywhere in sandals and dirty roads, and their feet were filthy. They were disgusting. It, it says, it, Craig Keener said this in his commentary. He said, many ancient eastern streets must have been unpaved and narrow, badly crowded, and some would have been choked with refuse and frequented by dogs and other sources of excrement. Here's the kind of roads that the disciples walked on in that day. And it they, they comes in and, and they, their feet haven't been washed yet and they're eating. And Jesus says, I would like to wash your feet. It was common in that day for a hospitable person to have a servant or a slave there at the entrance of the house to wash the feet of people as they came into the house. Some, we do this sometimes when it's snowing here in the Midwest. When you come in the house, what do you do when it's snowing? You take your shoes off at the front door. You don't do that. The South, it took us about two years to learn to do that here. The people are, they have these feet and they're filthy. And Jesus gets down and Peter says, Lord, do you wash my feet? Imagine if you had a relationship with the King of England, King Charles III. Unfortunately, in this fake story that I'm telling you now, 
You've had a spill and you've had an injury and you've been in the hospital for a while. But he comes to see you, even though you've been bedridden, because you're family friends and he sees a very full bedpan beside your bed. And King Charles, before you can get it out of your mouth, picks up the bedpan and empties it in the toilet and brings it back. Uh, don't do that. Don't do that. No, 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 no. Are you, you, you're not emptying my bedpan, are you? Like, that's not a thing. This is something similar to what Peter probably felt. Here's the Messiah. Here's his king getting down on his knees to wash his feet. Lord, do you wash my feet? Verse 7, Jesus answered him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand now, I think this is probably a double meaning here in verse 7. I think he's talking about when he says, you don't understand now, but you will later. I think he's referring to what he's about to teach them later on when he tells them why he does this. Because you see the word understand in both. When Jesus says later, do you now understand? But I also think it's a double meaning because they're not really fully understanding all of these things until after Jesus died and rose again. They're kind of walking in the dark a little bit. They don't realize that Jesus is going to Jerusalem not to be the king at that moment, but to die on the cross. And they, they don't see that yet. They don't realize it. And so Jesus says, what I'm doing, you, you don't understand, but you're going to understand it later. Look at what Peter said to him. You shall never wash my feet. King, you're never, I'm never going to be okay with you emptying my bedpan, king of England. You shall never wash my feet. Perhaps one commentator, not perhaps, one commentator translated it as, you shall never in all eternity wash my feet. He's extremely emphatic. And we can understand why he would say that, can't you? Why would you what are you doing, Jesus? No, 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 you're not doing this. Now notice how Jesus responds in verse 8. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Notice the tense of the verb in verse 8. If I do not wash you, you have no share. Your willingness to allow me to wash you reveals something about you. No share. Why is he using that word? That's similar to the words um, for the Israelites having a share in the promised land. Look, if you're not going to let me wash you, then you're not part of my kingdom, Peter. People who are part of my kingdom, let me wash them. But if you don't, then it means you're not part. It becomes evident to, this, to us at this point that Jesus, his washing of his feet is symbolic for something. How is it that Jesus, why would Jesus literally say, if you don't let me wash your feet, like what is it about the washing of his feet that is like a, an entrance exam, you might say, to being part of his kingdom? No, no, no. The washing is symbolic for what he's about to do the next day, you see. He's washing their feet, symbolizing what he's about to do when he's going to humble himself and he's going to wash them by his death on the cross, not of their feet, but of their sins. And if you don't let me wash you, Jesus says, then you have no part of me. Now, let me pause here for a minute. Now, Lindsay and I grew up in a denomination that literally washed one another's feet. And there were 10 people in the first service, so I'm going to count 10 plus however many of you. How many has literally washed a, someone else's feet, like, in church? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. Anybody in the balcony? Seven, eight. Okay, we've got 19 people. I see there in the back row. Hello, back row friends. So glad you're here today. 19 people out of the 20, of the however many of you. Now, you might think it's humbling to wash people's feet, and it is kind of gross. You got the toe jam, you got the floaties in the water. <laughs> that was gross, evidently. Um, it's humbling to wash someone's feet, but it might be more humbling to let someone you greatly respect wash your feet. And Peter doesn't want Jesus to do this. And I wonder... Some of you, dear friends, might have a completely wrong understanding about what it means to be a Christian. You might think that being a Christian is about your effort to live the Christian life as good as you possibly can. In this way, you see Jesus primarily as a good example. 
I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to live my life like Jesus by my own strength, by my own effort. And you're trying to earn your salvation. The book of Galatians speaks about this, and it says the question, did Christ die for no purpose? Do some of you live your Christian life as if Jesus' death was unnecessary? You don't really need atonement for your sin. You don't need to be washed. You just need an example to live. You're, you're washing yourselves, some of you are trying to, perhaps. You have to come to the point that you can never wash yourself. You've got to realize that. If you're going to be a real, actual Christian, you've got to realize you can never clean yourself up enough. You have to let Christ wash you, friends. You have to let him. If you do not let me wash you, you have no part of me, he says. You have to let Christ be the only one who saves you. Not you, not your good works, not your baptism, not your church membership, not your tithing, not your discipline, only Christ. If you don't let me wash you, you have no part of me, he says. Here's what Philip Melanchthon said. He said, the only thing you contribute to your salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. When will some of you accept the fact that there is nothing you can do to save yourself? Will you ask Jesus to cleanse you? Will you let Jesus cleanse you? Well, let's continue now in verse 9. Peter has a little bit of a change of heart here, and he says, Simon Peter said to him, verse 9, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Now remember what I said. Peter thinks be- he speaks before he thinks. There's hope for you, dear friends, who think before you speak. He's like, oh, wait, uh, look, if, uh, if the condition for being part of you is washing my feet, let's just, let's just have a bath. Let's just do a whole sponge bath here, Lord. And he's just kind of talking off the top of his head. He doesn't quite understand what Jesus means. Jesus responds in verse 10. Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. He's using this reality of the way that they would bathe as to correct Peter here. Look, you've already had a bath. I'm not here to clean your whole body. You just, the feet are the issue here. And he says, and you are clean, but not every one of you. Now remember, we've already seen that John has showed us that it was already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. And Jesus recognizes this. It would say later, he would say later in chapter 15 that you are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. You become clean spiritually by faith in Christ by believing what the gospel says about what Jesus has done for you and his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, just accepting it and believing it. That's it. And this is how you become clean. And Jesus says, you are all clean, except not every one of you. He's talking about Judas, of course. It says in verse 11, for he knew who was to betray him. And that was why he said, not all of you are clean. Now Jesus is going to pivot and tell us why he has done what he just did in verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? Remember he said, what I'm doing now you will not understand. Now he's done it and he says, do you understand? Verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord. You're right, for so I am. Now, he puts his collared shirt back on, and he goes to sit back on that one side of the table. And then he says to them, look, you realize what's happening? You recognize why I did this? Notice that Jesus doesn't deny who he is. You call me teacher and Lord. He says, you're right. Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, dear friends. I am the Messiah. You're right. I am the teacher and the Lord. Look at what he says then in verse 14. Here's his main point. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Now what Jesus is doing here is what's called an argument from the greater to the lesser. It's like saying, Pastor Adam is way more awesome than Pastor Jacob, which is probably true in most ways. 
Uh, and so if Pastor Adam can do this, if he deserves a million dollar bonus at Christmas, then certainly Pastor Jacob deserves five bucks, right? So that's an argument from the greater to the lesser with no implications there. Um, subtly, that's not why I'm saying that. Here's what he says. If I'm the Lord and the teacher, if I'm the Messiah, I'm the one you've been following for three years, and if I'm washing your feet, then don't you think you should wash one another's feet? Obviously, you should. The answer is yes. Elizabeth Elliot, I've got an extended quote here, and I've only got to put the end of it on the screen, but here's what she said. She said, Lord, I've got a picture over here for you. Lord, break the chains that hold me to myself. Free me to be your happy slave. That is, to be the happy foot washer of anyone today who needs his feet washed, his supper cooked, his faults overlooked, his work commended, his failure forgiven, his griefs consoled, or his button sewed on. Here's the quote on the screen. Let me not imagine that my love for you is very great if I'm unwilling to do for a human being something very small. Church family, if Jesus served us, shouldn't we serve one another? Verse 16, truly, truly, I say to you, here's the principle that undergirds the whole thing. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Two th examples that Jesus uses, and the answer is obvious. True, obviously, the servant isn't greater than his master. Jesus, being the master, he did this. For the servant to not do it would imply that the servant is greater than the master. Jesus, being the one who sends, if he does this, certainly the one who is bringing his message should also do it. Here's a really hard-hitting truth. Refusing to serve others in humbling ways is acting as if we're better than Jesus. Did you hear that? Refusing to serve others in humbling ways, it's acting like you're better than Jesus. Because Jesus humbled himself to serve us, and if he's your master, then you're going to do what he does. And if you refuse to do what he does, then it implies that he's not your master. Why would you do that, Jesus? That's dumb. Do you recognize what we're saying to Jesus and what we're communicating about Jesus whenever we refuse to humble ourselves and serve one another? We're saying that he was foolish to do that. He was dumb to do that. But we're not better than our master. If our master's done it, then ought we, should we not also do the same thing? No, I won't take out the trash. It's gross. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. No, I won't give that person a ride to church. It's out of my way. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. No, I don't think our life group should serve homeless people this Christmas. They stink. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. No, I'm not going to befriend that kid at school. He's weird. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Why do we think we're better than the king of the universe? 1 Peter 5, 5, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God, what does it say? God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The last part of this account we'll look at today is verse 17. Are you still with me? Verse 17, look at it. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now that we understand why he did this, to communicate that he wants us to do the same thing. He tells us something that seems completely countercultural to our thinking. I don't, know, I don't know about you, but I generally think that I will be blessed if you serve me. <laughs> right? Didn't we think that? I'm going to be blessed in my life if you serve me. My flesh, my sinful flesh, has the perspective <clears throat> that I want the whole world to treat me like an experience at Chick-fil-A. I walk in and they start smiling randomly for no reason. And they're thrilled that I'm there. And they have this amazing heaven-sent chicken to give to me with this sauce that's made from baby angel tears. 
And then whenever I give them my money, they say, they say, my pleasure. Why aren't the people at my church doing that for me every time I walk in the door? Aren't they thrilled? Don't they realize that everything should be like Chick-fil-A? We think it's a blessing to be served, but Jesus says that's actually not true. It's actually a blessing to serve. The winners at Chick-fil-A are the employees at Chick-fil-A because they're the ones who get to serve. Well, friends, what does a brother or sister in Christ have that you know that God has asked you to meet, but you've been hesitant because it requires you to humble yourself? How do you view your relationship with this church? You see it as a place you attend where the church is there to serve you and meet your spiritual needs? Or do you see yourself as a servant to the people in the church? One of those perspectives is what Jesus would have you do, and one of those perspectives is what the world would have you do. Is there something God wants you to do for something else, but you've been balking on it because of pride? But Jesus didn't wash my feet, you might say. He didn't wash my feet. I wasn't there. He did that to them. He said that for them. Remember, John's showing us a picture of what Jesus was about to do the next day. That's what the whole feet washing is about. He's, he's picturing what he's about to do. It's symbolic. And what he did the next day absolutely was for every single one of us. When he died on the cross, Jesus didn't wash your feet, okay, but he willingly allowed himself to be, be betrayed by the people he had invested his life in for the last three years. Remember that one of the people whose feet he washed was Judas. Remember, he allowed himself to be beaten for you. Remember, he was whipped to the point of death for you. Remember, he allowed the designer of the people who did it, allowed them to shove the thorns in his skull for you. He was spit upon for you. He had a crown of thorns. He, he was ridiculed. He carried his cross publicly, barely clothed for you. He was hung to be mocked and ridiculed in the middle of two people that actually deserved it while he was innocent the whole time. He willingly gave up his life and suffered the punishment that you and I deserve because of our sin to serve you, to wash you, and to wash me, and to serve me. And so I conclude just simply with this main point. Since Jesus humbled himself to serve us, we should humble ourselves to serve others. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we can identify with Peter's refusal to want you, to allow you to do that, Lord, if if we knew Even Peter, Lord, when you said that you were going to die, he, he said, may it never happen. Because we know who you are. You're the king. And you're our creator. And you're our sustainer. And so, Jesus, it's, it's really, it's hard for us to even imagine that, that you would want to do that for us. But, Lord, we also acknowledge that we're prideful people. And we don't want to really admit to you or to admit to others that we can't wash ourselves. And we have to have you wash us. And so, Lord Jesus, because of what you've done, I believe that, Lord. I believe in what you've done for me. And I accept it, Jesus, all the way since I was a little boy. I'm so thankful, Jesus, 
for how you served me and how you took upon flesh to wash me. And I love you. I belong to you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I want to serve these people. And we want to serve others. Would you help us to take up the basin and the towel and to prepare ourselves to get dirty and to humble ourselves, even in ways that other people would say, no, 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 that's too much. Because you've served us, God. You've served us, Lord. So, Lord, help us to be servants for one another. We need your help. In Christ's name, amen. Musicians and deacons,